This is an Acer Aspire E1570, which is from 2013. A friend of mine gave it to me recently. It's 13 years old and still running Windows 8. My plan is to fix it up and attempt the OS hat trick, Windows, Apple and Linux. But first, let's repair it and update the old boy. As you might imagine, this 13 year old battery is out of charge. But for Christmas, I got this nifty 100 watt wall charger. To charge the laptop, I'm using this USB-C to 5.5 by 1.7 adapter. And you can see here, it's still got the account on from the previous owner. But I'll use the password login to show you what the main issue with this laptop is. Only certain keys work, which is not particularly helpful, as you might imagine. And next, let's find out if the battery has taken some charge. But, unfortunately not. This battery is as dead as a dodo, and we'll need replacing. So it's time to flip the laptop over, and look at this relic, Windows 8 sticker. With the laptop on its back, it's now easy to get into the access panel for the RAM and the hard drive, by unscrewing this one screw. Pop the cover off, and this machine is running low voltage, 16 megahertz DDR3 RAM. This single stick in there is four gigabytes, so an easy win right here is to fit another stick of RAM, therefore doubling the RAM to eight gigabytes. And then we move on to the hard drive. It took a decent while to start up, so by sticking in an SSD, that will significantly improve the boot time and speed this machine up no end. And now to get access inside, we need to undo an ungodly amount of screws on this back panel. Back in 2013, laptops still had these things called CD drives. So I pop that out, pull out the battery. This battery is listed as 14.8 volt, but personally, I'd say it's a 16 volt battery, as I suspect it has four 18650s in this casing. With a fully charged voltage per cell of 4.2 volts, 14.8 volts would be its nominal voltage of 3.7 volts per cell. And there you go, some rather exciting battery trivia there. And with the screws removed from the back, we can now remove the keyboard, carefully working around the edge of the laptop until we hear click. Lift the keyboard up, being careful not to rip the ribbon cables inside. My bare poor hands are a particular hindrance at times like these. But unclip the cables and the keyboard is off. Just taking a second to familiarise myself with what's in there. And then the penny drops. I've just figured out. I need to remove the whole board to get to the CPU. Undo the single Wi-Fi antenna. Unscrew the speaker. Remove the two screws holding the motherboard down, using tape to mark the mounting holes before it evaporates from my brain. I start to gently try and pry the motherboard out, but I realise pretty quickly I'm going to have to use a bit of grunt force to squeeze it out. With the FUD that delicate electrical parts shouldn't make, it's out. Flip it over and have a look. And we can see the PCH chip here, and the CPU is under this heatsink. Undo the screws holding the heatsink down, and surprise surprise, the heatsink fins are not caked in dust. The thermal paste on the other hand is particularly dry. Bust out the IPA to clean the old paste off. Apply a new thermal paste. Fit and screw the heatsink back down. Flip the board over and shoehorn it back into place, which I managed to do without breaking anything. Screw the board down. Hook all the connectors back up. Fit the speaker back in place. Bit of captain tape to hold the Wi-Fi antenna in place. Now it's time to fix this dodgy keyboard. I managed to get a light for light replacement off eBay, which I can now fit. Bit of messing about with this, as I suspect the person who removed it off the donor laptop was a bit heavy handed. But hook the ribbon cables back up, screw everything back together, pop the optical drive back in, SSD back in, cover on, and with the final screws in, it's done. And we have some collateral damage here in the shape of broken case parts. New shiny battery. Fit the new one. How painless was that? I hope Apple are taking notes here. And now for a once over with the brush and some IPA to clean this old boy up. And we're ready to attempt the OS hat trick. First up in the operating system list is Windows. And of course, Windows 11 just for fun. As this laptop has an i5 third gen CPU, it's five generations, technically too old, to install Windows 11 the conventional way. And this is why we look to Reliable Rufus to sort this issue out for us. With USB stick plugged in with Windows 11 ISO on, we turn the Acer on, and initially, I think there's a problem. 
because we get nothing other than the Acer logo. But finally, it kicks into life and the Windows 11 install screen starts. With the first hurdle overcome, it's time for some hydration of the amber variety. Also, this is taking so long, I need some snacks. With Windows 11 finally installed, I can take a quick look at how the system is handling it. And you might find this hard to believe, but this i5 third gen CPU is having a hard time. I'll go on and get OBS installed so you can see the screen better. OBS up and running after what is an extremely slow download. And you can see here OBS is causing a slight problem with the amount it's drawing from the CPU. Double check if we can run YouTube on this dinosaur. And it can. Not the best. It's kind of crappy with 1080p, but I was expecting that. What I really want to know is, will it run Age of Empires? But I think now, in an act of fairness, I'll turn OBS off to help the CPU out. CD in. Install it. Check this out for some nostalgia. But we hit a snag. Incorrect drivers. I did try a few things to mitigate this, but I wasn't going to go trawling the internet to maybe find some drivers that worked. So unfortunately, no Age of Empires. With Windows ticked off the list, let's move on to Linux. So we swap out our friend Rufus for Ventoy. Select Pop OS from the list of distros in Ventoy. Install Pop OS, which was about as simple as a Linux distro install get. And it's Friday night, if you couldn't tell. I've not used Pop OS before, but it's a Linux distro that's considered slick and modern with great ease of use features. With the install completed, I want to get HTOP installed to keep an eye on the CPU. So I run the command to install it, which fails. I try BTOP, it fails. So I try to update and upgrade, fails. Then I remember a small detail, something called the internet. After setting up Wi-Fi, my install problems magically disappear. BTOP installed. Now time to flat back in OBS for a screen recorder. It was so slow, I could feel my beard growing. Quick update and upgrade to freshen up the packages, then a restart. And now we're back in. I want to get some temperature sensors and fan sensors going so I can see what the laptop is doing under load. It turns out there's no fan sensor. So we just end up with temperature sensors, which I could have just looked at BTOP for. As we all know, any Linux review requires the obligatory NeoFetch slash FastFetch. I install NeoFetch. There you go. FastFetch isn't in Pop OS's repositories, which I didn't expect. I get around this by installing FastFetch via pre-built release. Here you can see the little NeoFetch FastFetch comparison. I'm a NeoFetch man personally, which would look better on this screen if you didn't have such weird resolution. Gotta see what Geekbench score this machine gets. Download Geekbench. Extract it. Set it up. Also, I couldn't figure out why it wasn't running. The smart ones will see, I'm typing Greekbench, not Geekbench. Anyway, overcome my spelling hurdle and run Geekbench. And with Greekbench running, I think it's time to look at the tiling option, which I regret instantly. As a creature of habit, tiling isn't for me. You can see the temp sensors on the two cores are nice and cool, which I'm pleased about with the Geekbench score running. And here's the scores. I'm kind of impressed with those scores being so low that this laptop can run Pop! OS as well as it is. Quick honourable mention, LibreOffice, pre-installed, which is nice. And of course, it works flawlessly. Just going to have a quick rummage around Pop! OS and see what some of the settings do. Fancy new background, which I don't like change it for something darker. Going to do a heavy workload test on it now and get a couple of YouTube videos playing in the background, a few other tabs, try and install Stacer with all this going on. Further punish the CPU with some Google Maps action. All this going on and the laptop isn't really skipping a beat. And I'm quite impressed with the old boy. Time now to give Mac OS a go. And at this point, I'd love to say I completed the hat trick. Windows, Linux, Mac OS. But Mac OS on the Acer E1570 just wasn't happening. I spent hours messing around in config files for the two installers I know, Clover and OpenCore. 
I tried installing both Mojave and Catalina versions of macOS using each bootloader, but nothing would work. I suspect it was a mixture of user error and hardware fighting back, but the closest I got was booting into both of the installers, which would initialize and then fail. I thought Clover was going to be my best option due to it being more legacy focused. I then tried OpenCore, which again would boot, attempt to install, and fail. I'll definitely be having another go at Hackintosh in the future, just on something maybe from this decade. We didn't manage the operating system hat trick, but we can manage this hat trick. Oh my goodness! It's a hat trick! Cheers. Thanks for watching. Joe.